the Atlanta press presses for answers. Within three days of the murder of Mary Fagan, both Newt Lee and Leo Frank sat in separate jail cells at Atlanta police headquarters. From the discovery of the body early Sunday morning, Atlanta's three daily newspapers, the Constitution, the Journal, and the Georgian, aggressively pursued every facet of the case with unbridled fervor. They profiled the victim and the suspects, examined physical evidence, recreated the murder scene, compared timelines, and dogged police, private eyes, witnesses, and suspects for interviews and leads. Newspapers at that time held immense power over the daily discourse, being the nation's single pre-radio and television source of political, economic, cultural, and social news and issues. The popular Frank narrative stresses that in their competition for readers and advertisers, the Atlanta press stirred up, quote, anti-Semitic passions, end quote. But there is little to support that serious charge. Despite the explosive racial dynamics of a fast unfolding murder case, including Leo Frank's insistence that, quote, a Negro, end quote, was responsible. A careful reading of the news coverage in the earliest stages finds no trace of anti-Semitism at all. The Anti-Defamation League's recently produced teacher's guide on the Fagan murder case claims that, quote, the notion of a perverted Jewish man lusting after innocent Christian children was planted in the minds of jurors and carried to the public through sensational newspaper editorials. End quote. But not a single article or editorial suggested anything of the sort. A month after the murder finds the Georgian editorializing an aggressive exoneration of Leo Frank. Quote, Frank never was seen with the girl, either on the day of the strangling or before. It is not known that he ever spoke to her except in connection with her work. Nothing was found to point the finger of accusation directly at Frank so far as the public has been informed. None of Frank's clothing has been found with blood stains upon it. No fingerprints upon the girl's body or her clothes were identified as his. None of his personal belongings were found near the girl's body. Absolutely nothing was discovered in the search of the detectives that fastened the crime on him. The police possibly would never even have known that Frank was the last person to see Mary Fagan, so far as is known, had it not been for his own free admission. He told the officers the moment he identified the body that that was the girl he paid at noon the day before. No one else knew that Mary Fagan was in the building at that time, so far as the evidence reveals. Frank did not have to tell if he had desired to conceal the fact. End quote. And that narrative accurately represents the tone and tenor of the news coverage by all of Georgia's press from the April murder right on through the August trial. Frank's Jewishness was never mentioned, except by inference when Frank's defenders raised his B'nai B'rith association, and then only as a means of reinforcing his integrity and character in the public's mind. By far, the greatest victim of negative and racist pretrial publicity was Newt Lee, whose Negroness was reestablished every time his name was mentioned in print. So intense was this assault that Mayor James Woodward had to step in to warn that a, quote, misleading and sensational headline, end quote, might, quote, inflame an element, end quote, against Lee, not against Leo Frank. Newt Lee was constantly referred to as a, quote, Negro, end quote, and openly threatened with death even in newspaper headlines. One Constitution article stoked Atlanta's lynching fever with the inflammatory headline, quote, your loyalty or, end quote, your, quote, neck, end quote. In that same article, printed three days after the murder, Lee's race is referred to nine times. By contrast, when Frank was arrested, it was not called an arrest, and it did not even make the headline. The news is buried in the 14th paragraph and is delivered protectively, with pains to assure that, quote, his detainment was more in the nature of an investigation, end quote. The Constitution counsels that it is a routine procedure, not indicative of suspicion. Indeed, the article credits Frank with providing information that led to the arrests of both Lee and one of the first white suspects, James Gant, both Gentiles. The next day's headline, quote, Leo M. Frank holds conference with Lee, end quote, presents Frank not as a suspect, but as an investigator. 
or better yet, as an inquisitor. Quote, it was believed Frank would be able to wring a confession from the Negro. End quote. Chief of Detectives Newport A. Lanford made it known that even though Mr. Frank was arrested and placed in custody, he would not be confined to a jail cell. Lanford had actually allowed Frank to employ a, quote, supernumerary policeman, end quote, so that Frank, quote, would be allowed the freedom of headquarters under charge of that policeman, end quote. Frank's religion is never mentioned or alluded to, and he is treated in print with the greatest of respect for his prominence in the community. Despite the well-worn but unprovable claims that the press fanned the flames of anti-Semitism, an analysis published in Forum magazine in 1916 reminds us, quote, And inasmuch as a race question has become identified with that case, let me remark in passing that all the early news copy relating to it passed through the hands of Jews. The managing editors of two newspapers and the city editor of a third were all Jews, end quote. Supernumerary policeman or not, a little girl was dead, and no one lost sight of the fact that Frank was the last man known to have seen Mary Fagan alive. The physical evidence of her murder, the blood and the hair, was found on the same floor where his office was located, and where he, by his own admission, had met with the girl just a few minutes before she was murdered. Prosecutors believed they had enough to hang Leo Frank for murder. The Trial of Leo Frank, The Theory and the Evidence In calling the state of Georgia's case against Leo Frank, quote, persuasive, end quote, the writer of a 742-page book on the case, Steve Oney, confronts those who suggest that anti-Semitic, prejudicial, rage motivated his prosecution. By the time of the trial, Mary Fagan's murder had been investigated by the coroner's office and four professional agencies the Atlanta Police Department, the Georgia State Prosecutor's Office, and the Pinkerton and William J. Burns Detective Agencies. The latter two were in the employ of Leo Frank, yet all four settled on a surprisingly similar theory, which revolved around a spider and web scenario. They contended that, on that Saturday, April 26th, Frank used the occasion of the weekly payday falling on a holiday, when the factory was closed and deserted, to corner the unsuspecting 13-year-old Mary Fagan into a sexual encounter. When she resisted him, the 29-year-old Frank used brute force to subdue her, and in the ensuing struggle he accidentally knocked her unconscious. Realizing the dire consequences of his act, Frank then intentionally killed her by strangling her with a six-foot piece of heavy twine of the kind commonly used around the factory. The circumstantial chain of time, motive, and opportunity, along with the physical evidence, made Frank's conviction likely, though not trouble-free. The jury would not only have to weigh the prosecution scenario, but also have to consider whether any other theory was even plausible. As lead prosecutor Hugh Dorsey would say, it was not a, quote, chain, end quote, of evidence, for, quote, the chain is not stronger than its weakest link, end quote. Instead, the state's case was more like the strands of a rope, where none of them may be sufficient in itself, but all taken together may be strong enough to establish the guilt of the accused beyond a reasonable doubt. The Evidence The state's case was built upon legitimate evidence, though there was one unusual feature that placed this prosecution in a class by itself. Key pieces of the state's theory relied on the testimonies of black witnesses to convince an all-white male jury that a prominent white male defendant was a murderer deserving of death. The state's solicitor, Hugh Dorsey, felt he could overcome that significant anomaly, and he assembled the case he would bring to a Georgia courtroom in August of 1913. Allegation Leo Frank murdered Mary Fagan in the metal room, which is located on the second floor down the hall from Frank's office. Evidence Police found splattered blood spots in the form of a fan on the floor in the metal room. A police officer testified, quote, I should judge the area around those splotches was a foot and a half. It looked like a white substance had been swept over it. End quote. 
factory manager N.V. Darley testified, quote, It looked like there had been an attempt to hide, end quote, the blood spots. Quote, The white stuff practically hid the spots, end quote. The white substance, known as haskaline, was sold and used as a lubricant for factory machinery. Only Frank appeared to have knowledge that it was actually made of, quote, soap and oil, end quote. And thus, he would have understood its value as a cleaning agent. Several witnesses said the blood spots were not there on the Friday before the murder. On April 26th, Frank spent nearly all of his time at the factory on the second floor. Allegation. Mary Fagan's head fell against a machine handle in the metal room. Evidence. Several strands of hair were found dangling from a lathe, hair strands that witnesses insisted were not there on Friday when the factory closed. The two wounds to Fagan's head, one on the face, the other on the back of the head, caused hemorrhaging beneath her skull and produced unconsciousness. The injuries were consistent with someone being punched in the face and then falling backward and downward against the machine's metal crank handle, with the projecting shaft tearing out some of her hair. Allegation. Mary Fagan was sexually assaulted before she died. Evidence. Dr. H. F. Harris's trial testimony confirmed that Fagan was bleeding from her vagina before she died. Quote, On the walls of the vagina, there was evidence of violence of some kind. The dilation of the blood vessels indicated to me that the injury had been made in the vagina some little time before death. There was evidence of violence in the neighborhood of the hymen. End quote. Allegation. The murder occurred at or about the time that Mary Fagan saw Leo Frank. Evidence. It is known that Mary ate cabbage a little before she left home to go to the factory that day. A chemical analysis of the progress and extent of digestion of the contents of Mary's stomach fixed the time of the murder at about the time that she met with Leo Frank. Prosecutor Hugh Dorsey brought his case to a Fulton County grand jury and on May 24th, Almost one month after the April 26th murder, Leo Frank was indicted for the murder of Mary Fagan. The 23-member grand jury included five prominent members of the Jewish community, all of whom, according to an internal ADL document, had voted for the indictment of Leo Frank. Among them was Victor Hugo Kriegshaber, a merchant and manufacturer who had been on the executive committees of both the National Conference of Jewish Charities and the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. All signed the bill of indictment, which read in part, quote, In the name and behalf of the citizens of Georgia, I charge and accuse Leo M. Frank, with the offense of murder, with force and arms, did unlawfully and with malice aforethought, kill and murder one Mary Fagan by then and there choking her with a cord placed around her neck." End quote. Newt Lee, they determined, would remain in custody as a material witness. With this grand jury vote affirming his investigation, Prosecutor Dorsey confidently prepared for the trial of Leo Frank, which would grip Atlanta for the summer of 1913. Enter Black Man Number 2, James Conley. While Prosecutor Dorsey prepared for trial, another figure emerged in the drama that had previously escaped almost everyone's notice. 27-year-old James Jim Conley had been employed at the factory for two years as an elevator operator and then as a sweeper. On May 1st, a week after the murder, the pencil company's day watchman, E. F. Holloway, claimed to have seen Conley at the factory washing blood from his shirt. Conley said that it was a rust stain he was cleaning but Holloway called police, who quickly took the black man into custody. Oddly, the idea that in the lynch mob South, a black murderer of a white girl would return to the scene of his crime a week later, not only wearing a bloodstained shirt, but also laundering it in front of white witnesses, did not seem absurd to investigators. According to the Georgian, quote, the police were inclined to attach a little importance to his arrest, end quote. What should have been a bombshell break in the case was met with a curiously subdued police and press reaction. Most puzzling, though, was the utter indifference of Leo Frank, 
then in jail facing a capital murder charge. He and his team had proclaimed the murder to be a, quote, Negro crime, end quote. Yet the arrest of a bloody shirt-washing Negro employee, which should have elicited cries of exoneration, aroused no excitement and induced not a single comment. An obviously counterfeited, quote, bloody shirt, end quote, was clumsily planted in Newt Lee's home. But here was an actual, quote, bloody shirt, end quote, at the crime scene, still worn by a black man. It is as if Conley had slipped into jail, where he sat anonymously under the radar for the next few weeks. It turns out that the stain on his shirt was in fact rust, but police continued to hold him anyway. James Conley was washing his shirt because he, like all the factory's employees, had been subpoenaed to appear at the coroner's inquest to tell what he knew about the events of the day of Mary Fagan's murder. Fulton County's no-nonsense coroner, Paul Donahue, had the power to question witnesses under oath to determine the cause and manner of death and to recommend indictment to a grand jury. It was the first official examination of the case, and all eyes were focused intently on the week-long event. But while in police custody, Conley missed the opportunity to testify. The arrest of Conley, just as the coroner's inquest was getting underway and on the word of a Frank employee, demands a closer look. According to trial testimony from factory superiors, the watchman who fingered Conley, E. F. Holloway, had actually been, quote, detailed to maintain an espionage over Conley, end quote. He was part of a surveillance operation within the factory itself, showing that Leo Frank and his team were extremely interested in the 27-year-old, quote, Negro sweeper, end quote, long before Holloway brought him to the attention of the Atlanta police. As Conley sat in jail out of the public spotlight during the week-long inquest, scores of factory employees and other witnesses testified, the three Atlanta dailies parsing every nuance and speculating about every possible murder scenario. Coroner Donahue concluded his inquest on Thursday, May 8th, finding that there was enough evidence to charge both Leo Frank and Newt Lee. But Atlanta was stunned at what came next. Just days after the inquest, the forgotten sweeper James Conley was revealing a minutely detailed account of the events of April 26th, alleging that his white boss, suspect Leo Frank, was the murderer of Mary Fagan. After leaking selective details of the story, Conley finally divulged the particulars of the murder and, for many, put all speculation to rest. He said that by pre-arrangement, made the previous day on April 25th, Frank met him at the factory on that holiday morning. Frank had offered to employ him, not to sweep as usual, but to sit in the first floor stairwell as a lookout as he, Frank, had a private rendezvous with an unnamed woman just upstairs in his second floor office. It was a role Conley claimed to have performed for Frank several times, when Frank used his office for trysts with women other than his wife. According to Conley, when Mary Fagan arrived for her pay a little afternoon, he saw her go up the stairs on her way to Frank's office. While in his position at the first floor stairwell, Conley says he heard two sets of footsteps go from Frank's office to the rear of the second floor, but then heard a scream and only one set of steps return. Moments later, a visibly shaken Leo Frank signaled Conley to come upstairs and directed him to the back room, where Conley discovered the girl's body, bloodied and lifeless, with a cord wrapped tightly around her neck. Frank explained that he had tried to have sex with the girl, but when she resisted, he struck her, leading to her accidental and tragic demise. Conley's account was rich enough with significant details to startle the police by its accuracy. His narrative of that day's events corresponded to the physical evidence police had collected and with the accounts of other witnesses, and, most important for investigators, a motive came into full view. Conley said that Frank then ordered him to carry the body to the basement, but it was too heavy for him to carry alone. He asked Frank for help, and, using the elevator, they both moved Mary's body and effects and then returned to Frank's second-floor office. Once there, the nervous factory superintendent gave Conley a pad of paper and ordered him to write out four separate notes, two of which would eventually be found by the police next to the body. The two notes became the feature of the case that most flummoxed investigators. 
The cryptic language suggested they were written by the suffering victim, who in her last breaths scrawled the identity of her killer. But they were written in a rather unconvincing Negro dialect, with misspellings intended to suggest the writer was an uneducated black man. The first note read, quote, He said he would love me and land down, play like Night Witch did it, but that long, tall black Negro did buy his slough. End quote. And the second was more descriptive. Quote, Ma'am, that Negro higher down here did this. I went to make water, and he pushed me down that hole. A long, tall Negro, black, that who it weighs, long, slim, tall Negro, I write while play with me. End quote. The ruse fooled no one, in that Mary herself was never considered the author, and the police naturally deduced that the slayer had to be the author. It was generally assumed in the post-slavery South that all blacks were unable to read or write, the calculated result of Jim Crow racism, so the presence of notes and the rather complex intent of the message made it impossible to classify Mary Fagan's death as a typical Negro crime. When James Conley was arrested, he denied he could read or write, but police found out through some pawn shop receipts he had signed that the factory sweeper could indeed write, and they began to increase the pressure on him. Quote, I wrote those notes, end quote. Conley would later testify in court. Quote, Mr. Frank had me write them. I didn't know what he wanted with them, and he gave me some money to do it, end quote. He said that as Frank concocted the notes to pin the crime on a black man, he made the cold-hearted comment, quote, Why should I hang? I have wealthy people in Brooklyn, end quote. Frank then ordered Conley to return later that afternoon to burn the body in the factory furnace. Conley agreed, but never returned, later saying he was too scared and went home to stay. And so, for about 15 hours, the body remained in the basement, where night watchman Newtley found it early the next morning. Asked why he had released the story gradually, giving the appearance that he was lying, Conley said that he had tried to cover for his employer by sticking with their pre-arranged story. Quote, I didn't tell the whole truth then because I didn't want to give the whole thing away then. End quote. As Frank came under more and more police pressure, his public claims that Mary's demise was a, quote, Negro crime, end quote, sounded to Conley as if Frank was getting ready to pin the murder on him, causing Conley finally to confess to his accessory after the fact role. His statement was recorded in the Atlanta Constitution. Quote, it's the truth, though, the whole truth, and I hope to God that he strikes me dead this very instant, if it ain't. I was intended not to tell the whole business. I was fixin' to take care of Mr. Frank like he told me to in the first place. I was going to keep my mouth shut and say nothing until some of those folks down at the pencil factory opens up and begins trying to make out that I killed the little girl and that I'm trying to save my own neck by fixin' it on Mr. Frank. That made me mad. It didn't make me any madder than it made me scared. I just put it down that if I didn't come on out with the truth, they would get me and hang an innocent nigger. I called for Mr. Detective Black that Saturday and begins to open up. I was afraid even then, though, to tell the whole business. Finally, the thing got to working in my head so much that I just couldn't hold it any longer. I couldn't sleep, and it worried me mightily. I just decided it was time for me to come on out with it, and I did. The detectives and Chief Lanford treated me mighty fair, and I felt a whole lot better when I went up before them and told the truth. I don't think I slept better in a long time than I slept last night. I knew I had told the truth, and I felt like a clean nigger. They won't do much with me, I don't think. Mr. Hugh Dorsey, he came a long time ago when I first started to open up, and told me everything was all right, and for me to go ahead with everything I knew. End quote. Meanwhile, Leo Frank was sitting in the Atlanta City Jail, still denying any knowledge of Mary Fagan's murder. But as soon as Conley's bombshell statement became known, a reporter hurried down to get Frank's reaction, and it was truly striking. Quote, What have you to say to this? demanded a Georgian reporter. Frank, as soon as he gained the import of what the Negro had told, jumped back in his cell and refused to say a word. His hands moved nervously, and his face twitched as though he were on the verge of a breakdown. 
but he absolutely declined to deny the truth of the Negro statement or to make any sort of comment upon it. His only answer to the repeated questions that were shot at him was a negative shaking of the head or the, end quote, reply, quote, I have nothing to say, end quote. Once Frank recovered and regrouped, the lawyered-up defendant made a full-throated denial and countercharged that, quote, the Negro Conley, end quote, was the real murderer. And for the first time in American history, the word of a wealthy and well-connected white businessman was being openly defied and disputed by a poor working-class black laborer in a court proceeding. Each accused the other of a most heinous crime, and there was no middle ground. One of the two... Leo Frank or Jim Conley, would face certain death at the end of a hangman's rope. The fact that a Negro charged a white man with murder, that act itself being a lynchable crime in America, stunned Atlanta, sending newspapers into multiple editions. Conley's confession of his role in the cover-up provided the state with its first actual witness to the crime and added an explosive new racial dynamic. It set the stage for the first major courtroom confrontation in the history of blacks and Jews in America. As the facts unfolded, it became clear to all that only Frank or Conley could have sexually attacked and murdered Mary Fagan. The only third option was that they had collaborated equally, meaning they both would hang. The historical odds were plainly stacked against the black man, but the Georgia prosecutors, in the state that led the nation in lynchings, would take their case to an all-white male Southern jury, asserting that Leo Frank, the white man, had committed the murder, and that Conley's version of events was the legal truth. If the scenario described by Conley had any truth in it, that some collaboration existed between him and Leo Frank, then the fortuitously timed arrest of Conley to keep him from being aggressively questioned at the coroner's inquest may have been yet another strategic maneuver by Frank's forces. A move, they now saw, that had backfired. Be with us again next time when we present the next chapter of The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, Volume 3. The Leo Frank Case, The Lynching of a Guilty Man. Prepared by the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam, Chicago, Illinois. Copyright 2016 by Latimer Associates. All rights reserved. Published in audiobook form by the American Mercury with permission of the Historical Research Department of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam. Of the Nation of Islam.